when the, when the Uzziah the king died, he said, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord high and lifted up. You know, the Lord, even in our most difficult times, when it seems like something maybe has died in our life, uh, uh, whether it's a dream, a situation, a circumstance with King Uzziah dying, everybody was in uproar. Who's going to look after the land? Who's going to bring protection? What about all the treaties with all the enemies? And there's a lot of confusion. But it said, when Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. I'm believing for everyone here today that you would see the Lord high and lifted up. That whatever you're dealing with right now in your life, how, uh, however bad it is, difficult, strenuous, confusing, chaotic, that you would see the Lord high and lifted up. That the glory of his train would fill the temple. There'd be a sense of deep awe and worship of the Lord. And I'm praying that today, everyone, every heart, every life, young and old, you'd get a sense of revelation of who the presence of God is in your life. Father, I pray for everyone here today. God, as we stand and as we worship, as we give praise to you, you would reveal yourself. God, we want to know the Lord high and lifted up in our circumstances, in our situation, right now, today, where we're at. Come and reveal yourself to us. Everybody said? Come on, everybody said? All right, why don't we stand up? Let's worship the Lord. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. Oh, my praise belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come together, sons and daughters. Bow with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Oh, our God will finish what He started. Oh, this is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify 
on my soul Oh, don't you get shy on me Lift up your song You've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Oh, come on, my soul Oh, don't you get shy Second Chronicles, Solomon. After he's built the temple of the Lord, he gathers all of Israel, all of the nation of Israel, all the men, the women, and the children, um, into one large gathering, and he builds this platform. And he climbs up onto this platform, and when he gets on it, he kneels down, and he lifts his hands towards heaven, and he says these words: He says, "O Lord, God of Israel." There is no God like you in heaven or on earth, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all of their hearts. And I love that the king of Israel comes up and he, he humbles himself. What more do I have to offer except for my praise and adoration towards God is a hallelujah. The king of Israel comes and he, he bows down. He says, I'm nothing. And so I think I'd pray, Lord, that we would be a people who give you all of our hearts. Before man, we would not be ashamed to testify of who you are, that we would give you what we have, and that's a hallelujah our praise, our adoration towards you. I pray that we would be a community of faith that gives everything that we have to you because there is no God like you and no one is worthy except you. So this morning we worship you, God. We turn our hearts towards you. Well, if you're new here, welcome to the Pearl Church. My name is Trent. Um, you don't need to know that, but <laughs> that's my name. <laughs> We're just going to greet people. Maybe if you see someone new or someone you haven't seen in a while, go say hi, good morning, um, get the lowdown of what they've been doing this week, and then we'll come back with some announcements in the Word.
All right, praise God. Let's make our way back to uh, our seats. Amen. All right. Well, praise God. Great to be here in the house of the Lord. And um, God is doing some great things. I uh, just want to let you know I've been talking to a bunch of pastors. Uh, we're part of affiliation with uh, MFI International as well as uh, there's a large group of pastors here in town that I'm uh, connected with. And I'll tell you, there's just a lot of excitement in the local churches of what's going on. Although there's a, a lot of uh, opposition and different things taking place in the culture today inside the churches, there's a good fire that is burning on. It's uh, being stoked by the presence of God and God's people that are showing up back at church and being a part of things. And uh, there's just a lot of excitement about what's taking place and where things are going. So um, just want to let you know, hey, just like here in our church, I, lo I love the presence of, of the Lord here in our church. I love coming every Sunday and being a part of what God is doing. So uh, thank God that you're here. And uh, those that are online, uh, we could do have a place for you here. We do have still room for you. So come on out. Well, as we make our way... Uh, the uh, opportunities for you to invest into uh, an eternal investment, but also that you reap personal benefits as well as through the tithes and offerings that God has prescribed through the word of God to enable not just for the kingdom to make its way in the earth, but also for your life to be open to the things that God wants to do and to bless you and to encourage you. You know, there's a passage in the Bible out of uh, uh, Malachi and uh, Oftentimes when the pastor goes to read this, uh, people begin to get squirmy. But, but please don't, because he, he, hear the heart of the Lord here. It says, will, will a man rob God? And you say, well, where have we robbed you? In what manner have we robbed you? And it says, in tithes and offerings. And then it goes on and it says, uh, uh, for you, uh, he says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. That's the local church, that there might be food in my house and try me now in this. Test me. And I love this. The, the Lord says, you know what? Uh, I want to have this relationship with you that even your finances are under my uh, blessing, under my favor, under my authority, so that I can bring enlargement in your life. And he says this, and he says, test me. This is the only place that God says you can test me. He says, if I will not open, the he uh, open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. How many would like to have that you run out of room for God's blessing? And I'd love to have that. I mean, I have a bit of space in my house. And I say, God, fill it so there's no room left. And uh, that's what God wants to do. But it's not in our house only. It's in our life, in, in our marriages, in our homes, in all these places that our finances, as we give it to God, opens up an opportunity for God to bless. But then he says this, and I will rebuke the devourer, Satan, for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the food, fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit in the, the field. And God is basically saying, hey, enemy, you, you hands off this person because he's a tither. Hands off this person. He gives with generosity. Hands off this person because he walks in the obedience in this realm where the enemy wants to even touch the fruit of the field, uh, touch the areas of our blessing in, in our life, the, our jobs and our finances. The Lord says that they're protected because they walk under the canopy of grace due to their giving of tithes and offerings unto the Lord. And there's something that God just wants to do in your life and my life, and he wants to even touch into the realm of our financial, our, our business, our areas of our giving and our banks and all these kind of things. God wants to pour favor on us. So I, I just want to let you know that as leaders, we do pray for you in this area as well, for people to get jobs, uh, that need jobs, that uh, if you've got a job, that you get a better job. Anybody here have a job and you want a better job? Well, you know what? We pray for that because we want you to be blessed in the earth. God wants to pour out his blessing in your life. So uh, you see on the screen how you can give into the house of the Lord uh, different ways. So we encourage you. Uh, the planning center um, is really the best way to get on there, and I encourage you to uh, continue to give. Uh, the young adults um, are uh, on Facebook. You can go to the Facebook young adult page, and you'll see how that they are continuing in their various studies, the Book of Ruth, uh, or their activities that they're doing. Get involved. You're not meant to walk alone in this earth, this existence. You do it alone, and it's hard. Young adults, get together. Be a part of what God is doing and strengthen one another. And, uh, and then what else do we have for uh, 
announcements? Do we have anything else here? Oh, yeah, on Wednesday nights we're doing Joshua, uh, Book of Conquest, looking at uh, how the Old Testament Book of Joshua affects you and I in our walk with the Lord and the encouragement in there. And we had a great time last Wednesday. And uh, what it does also gives opportunity for testimonies, blessings, encouragements from the people that attend, and that's always good as well. Um, and then I think, is that it? That's it. All right. Let's dismiss the kids' ministry. They can make their way over. All right. Hey, let's, uh, let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew. We're uh, still continuing in this series on the parables of Jesus. I'm having a blast studying the scriptures in the book, uh, talking about the parables of Jesus. There are lessons to be found. I go through, I have different Bibles. I have Bibles that... Uh, um, that I've had over the years, um, back from 1982 is my first Bible. I still have it, and then consequently, uh, as I upgraded my Bibles, uh, but my Bibles are always written in. Uh, I got crayons, I got felt pens, I got highlighters, I got writing upside down, backwards, forwards. They're all in there, and it's amazing when I go through and I'm studying a pit, uh, passage. I'll, I'll go to even to my old Bibles because there was, believe it or not, some revelation from other senior pastors that I've either been under or listening to or different preachers and teachers and their gold little nuggets and those kind of things. So I go through my own Bibles and, uh, and then I just say, God, freshly, what, what is it you want to say through this passage? Although I've read it before and I've seen it before and I've got other ideas of how it can be taught. And I just love how the fact God brings out uh, new, new understanding. And, uh, you know, when it talks about the manna that God brings, he always brings out fresh manna. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. And we know that God's word is manna, and it brings out fresh. So I encourage you, even when you uh, say, well, hey, I've already read the parables. I know the parables. No, read it again. God wants to bring fresh revelation to you about his passages. Uh, and, th and that's why I, I really like uh, looking at what we, we have so far. Matthew 13, we talked about the sower and the seed. And just very quickly, that if the seed will find good soil, which is our heart, we saw the interpretation Jesus interpreted for us, and it says, you know, if the seed can find good soil, your heart, my heart, it can bring productivity. There can be fruitfulness. Spiritual life can come out of it, 30, 60, 100 fold, as opposed to having a hard heart where the seed has no growth in it, or that you can have the uh, uh, tampered down soil where all of a sudden it just springs up a little bit, but the persecution comes and the difficulties of life and then you walk away or even the uh, heart where the word comes in and there's thorns and there's cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of this world and they choke out the very life but if your heart is good towards God willing to obey and to hear the word will bring life in you and when you hear and obey there's a harvesting of the goodness in favor of God. Last week we looked at Matthew 7 and we looked at the wise and foolish men who build their house and uh, all about the foundation. Are you building it on sand, the shifting sands of this world, the culture, Facebook, Instagram, all these things that everybody's got a voice in? Are you building on that? Or are you building it on the rock Christ Jesus and his word? And when you build it on with his word and because we're all building something, we're building a character, we're building marriage, we're building relationships, we're all building something. But if we will build on the rock, whatever we're building, on the rock Christ Jesus says we'll endure the storms. And in the storms are the rains that beat down from above into our thoughts, and our thoughts can be affected. The winds that blow on the side, it touches our heart, emotions, and passions. And then the floods that come and want to take away the footing, the convictions, the belief systems we have. And if the enemy can bring these things into our life, uh, it can take us away from what God's trying to build in us. But if we build it on the rock, if we build our relationships on the rock, if we build our, our businesses on the rock, if we build our character on the rock, we can withstand the enemy that comes against us. And everybody is building, everybody will face storms, but the choice is us. Will we build it on the rock and be wise? Will we build it on the shifting sands of this world and uh, fall underneath the storms? Well, today I want to look at one of the shortest, the shortest, or two of the, one of the two shortest parables that Jesus uh, speaks about. And um, there's uh, two really one-sentence parables that, that are there. But as we look at this one here, it might be short, but I, I believe it's one of the most profound um, uh, parables that there is for you and I. Because if you get it, if you get really what the 
uh, mystery is behind this, this parable. I, I believe it can change your life and set you on a course of understanding uh, that you will also deal with the attacks of the enemy that you and I all deal with. Um, uh, and so let me just start with, with, with this out of um, 2 Corinthians 11, 3. Paul, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he opens up his heart as a pastor, as a leader, as a father, and he says, but I fear, I fear least somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Let me read it out of the message. And now I'm afraid that exactly as the snake seduced Eve with his smooth tongue, you are being lured away from the simple purity of your love for Christ. Paul is saying, hey, as, as a pastor, as a father to you, I'm afraid of something. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of something for your life as a believer, as a disciple, as a follower of Christ. And, and he says that I'm afraid that somehow Satan can corrupt your mind, your thinking, can deceive you, and as it were, lure you away from the simplicity regarding your love for Christ, your devotion for Christ. And then the enemy wants to come in and, and, and deceive us in a way about this thing called love, this love that we have for God. And here's what you have to understand out of 1 John 4, 19. It simply says this. We love him. Yeah, okay, we just stop right there. We love him. That's it. No, he says we love him because he first loved us. And the thing about our love for God and how the enemy can lure us away, corrupt our mind, take us away from the simplicity of this love is we think it's all about us, my love for God, how I love God, all that I do to love God and show him I love him. You cannot know what it is to really love God until you first know the love of God yourself. You can't love God until you know God loves you. Till you receive and experience the love that God has for you. We love him because he first loved us. And the attack of the enemy, the deception of the enemy is that he will applaud you because you go into this realm of understanding, no, I love God. Oh, I love God. I love God. And just like, no, you might love God, but you don't know how to love God until you know God's love for you. There are 39 parables that Jesus would, would tell within the Gospels. And uh, 13 of them are in the book of Matthew. Seven of those 13 start off with simply, uh, the kingdom of God is like this, is like. And this here is one of the one verse parable that we have. Let's read it, verse 44 of Matthew 13. And the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys the field. Now, as we get started here, I just want to remind you of why Jesus is using parables. There's a particular reason. The disciples came and said, hey, verse 10 of Matthew 13. And the disciples came and said, hey, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been. Well, there's an us and a them, but that us and them is not based on anything other than a willingness to have faith to believe in who God is. For whoever has to him will more be given, and whoever, he will have abundance, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. It's a parable to throw alongside of a truth, alongside of an event, a situation, and what it's doing is it's causing a, a, a response in the heart to not only see yourself in the parable, but then a, a response, what do I do with the truth that I now see in the parable? And you have to respond to it. What am I going to do about it? Jesus says to those who are willing in their heart to uh, receive his words by faith, to hear and to obey, he says, you become one that's eligible to see the mystery, get the mystery of the kingdom. People that have a hard heart, they don't get the mystery. People who say, well, I, you know what, Jesus is just a good teacher, but, you know, not more than that, not really a son of God, really I don't give my heart to him, I just, uh, he's, he's got good teachings. You'll miss the mystery. You might get the understanding of a passage in human form, but you don't get the mystery. And God's got a mystery about the kingdom of God that he wants you and I to live by, to get a hold of in our heart. 
The Holy Spirit is like nudging as you read this passage and your heart is open and you say, God, what is in it for me? And when you have that willingness, the Holy Spirit comes alongside of the words, dives in into the words, makes it come alive, and your heart grabs it and goes, whoa, that's a mystery that I never saw before, and you change your life according to it. That's what these parables are all about. And at first glance in Matthew 13, in this, this, this simple verse, Many times we, we, we look at it, and again, we always want to be the hero. It's always about us, right? But we look at it, and, and we think, well, the kingdom of heaven is the treasure, and, and we sell all that we have, and we go buy the kingdom, and it's all ours. We're the man. We, we've got this thing that we're always, I'm the man. I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the, Hey, I'm the David killing Goliath. No, you're not. Jesus is the David killing Goliath. Well, I thought it was about me. It ain't about you. It's about Jesus. But we take these scenarios in the Bible and we find application. It's all good. You can encourage yourself and devote in devotional, all this. But really, we can't kill no giant on our own. It's Jesus who kills the giant. But we look at this and we go, hold it. Okay, well, what's wrong with this view? Well, let me, let me give you three reasons why it's wrong about the kingdom being the treasure. Number one, you can't find it, you can't hide it, and you can't definitely buy it. Oh, okay, all right, I'm thinking to see it. Let me go a little bit further. You can't find the kingdom of God on your own. That's what the righteous think they can do. That if I do enough stuff, I can find the kingdom. Young rich man comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to enter the kingdom? I've done this, 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 this. Look what I've done so that I can have the kingdom. You can't find the kingdom of God. Until the Holy Spirit comes upon your life, you will never find the kingdom. We read in Corinthians that Satan has blinded the minds of the world so they can't see. They're in darkness. They are groping for the kingdom of God. And until the Holy Spirit shows up, and comes and touches their heart and their life because there's a willingness in them to want it, all of a sudden, that's the kingdom of God. I've been looking for it, and the Holy Spirit reveals it. Secondly, we can't hide it. Matthew 5 talks about us having having a lamp. There's a lamp in each one of us, a light in each one of us. And he tells us, do not hide the lamp that's in you under a bushel. Instead, put it on a table so that those in the room might be able to see the light of Jesus that's in you. But that's the light that's in you. That's not the kingdom of God. We do not have the ability, the power, we don't have the strength Who are we in the midst of everything that we can say, well, I can hide the entire kingdom of God. Watch what I can do. That would be pretty arrogant. That would be pretty prideful. It's too big for you. It's not yours to hide. And thirdly, thirdly, not only can you not find it or hide it, but you can't buy it. Number one, it's not for sale. The kingdom of God, constantly, over and over again, people try to buy certain things, buy the Holy Spirit, buy the gift of it, even try to buy the kingdom of God. And and you, you can't buy it. It's not for sale. And you don't have what it takes. You couldn't afford it. You can't buy your way into heaven. So what does this parable really say, and how does it apply to you and I? Well, let's look at it. We're not as fortunate as the other passage out of uh, the sower and the seed where Jesus just interprets it all. But out of the other parables, there are interpretations for us. All right. The first is simply the field. The field is the world. And in chapter 13 and uh, verse 38 out of the parable of the wheat and tares, he tells us very, very clearly. He says, the field is the word world. He says it. The field is the world. He gives us definition right there in verse 38. So it's, it's, the, it's the, the, the field, all right? The field is, not, is the world, not the kingdom. And secondly, the man is Jesus. It's not you. Again, we think we're the man, but it's not about us. It's about Jesus. You, however, are the treasure. You're the treasure. And here's what Jesus is trying to tell us. I became a man, and I came into the world, and I found you. I just didn't find you. I sold everything I had to buy you. 
this parable, this one verse parable, if we get it, if we truly understand who Jesus is, the, the field, the, the world, the treasure, if we understand this, our relationship with the Lord will take all of a sudden a leap forward. It speaks volumes here, just this one verse about God's love, Jesus' love for you. And you have to understand, it's not just a love or a devotion. It's a willingness to want you. He went to a lot of work to find you, to buy you, and later on to rejoice over you. It wasn't out of an obligation. Okay, Father, I have to go find them. All right, I'll go get them. Jesus, out of his love for us, says, I want to go. Let me at it. Where can I find him? I'm going into the world and find you and buy you and rejoice over you. He does it out of a willingness. And he says, it's a willingness, as we know out of other scripture, that he'll never leave us nor forsake us, no matter how far and deep you have been hidden in the world. It's easy to find something laying on the ground when it's just right there. But when you have to dig for it, when you've got to get down on the earth and begin to dig and dig and dig, and you've got to get dirty, you've got to get strenuous, you've got to work at your shop to find it. And it says, that's us. He comes after us. He digs for us. He goes to find us in our hurt, in our brokenness, in our disrepair, that no matter how far you are from him, he goes to find you. When he finds you, he pulls you in. He will find you and pay everything for you. And again, he's not obligated to do it. He's not obligated. He wants it. He does it out of this love he has for you. When you think of Jesus and the cross, where he came down to pay the ultimate price in John 10, verse 18, he says about his body going to the cross and dying, he says, no one takes this from me. But I lay it down, it says of myself, my own free will. I have the power to lay, lay it down, and I have the power to take it up. This command I received from my father. My father says, do as you want. Oh, Father, I want. I want to die for them. I want to go. I want to lay my life down. And then after I have died for them, I, I'll resurrect, but I've got to first die for them. He does it out, out of a, a desire. And he calls us. He calls us treasure. And he treats us like treasure. And I know that some, some of you may be here today. Some of you that are maybe watching online, you have a hard time equating yourself to being called treasure. Because maybe you've lived through a life, lived a life of mistreatment, abused, abandoned, rejected. You've been hurt, suppressed, oppressed. You've been dealt a hard life by the hands of those that you thought you were safe. You thought you would be cared for. You thought they would look after you and help you and love you. They would speak life into you. Instead, all you've had is hurt and pain. You go, I I'm not treasure, I'm throwaway. Look how I've been treated. And it's hard to associate the fact that I'm treasure. Jesus does none of those. Read the parable again. It says this in verse 44 again. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man, Jesus, found and hid and for the joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Open your hearts this morning to this beautiful passage. And let us sink down deep. Break up the hardness and hurt and regret and bitterness of life. Let it be ointment that would come in and soften your soul and soften your spirit to what God wants you for. First, understand this. Jesus finds you. You can't find him. Let me put it another way. You don't pursue Jesus. Jesus pursues you first. You know, too often, again, we want to be the hero of the story. And as you know what we do, we say something like this. Yeah, my life was a mess until I found Jesus. He wasn't lost. We had bumper stickers over the years. I found Jesus. Have you found him? It's like, where's Waldo type of thing? He's here somewhere. Where did he go? You know? 1990, what was it, 1994, 95, Delirious came out with a song, I found Jesus. Come on, we know what that is, why I see and all that going on. But, you know, I, I love it. It's a good part. You know, people say, hey, you, did you find Jesus? Yeah, man, I found him in my situation, this and this, this, you know. And I get why we say I found Jesus. But you didn't find him. He found you. 
The Holy Spirit came into your life, opened up your heart, awakened something in you, then all of a sudden you, ah, yes, he's been there all the time. Right back in the book of Genesis, when don't need to turn to it, but we know it's Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve were in the garden, and they're walking in the, in the midst of the day with, with the voice of Jesus or the voice of God back and forth. They're talking, and everything is great. Satan comes in and tempts them, and so they fall. And all of a sudden, that there's a breaking of this relationship between Adam and Eve and God. God said, the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Die in our relationship and die physically. And what happens? All of a sudden, they realize, it says they were naked and ashamed. What did they do? They go hide behind a tree. How smart is that? God, who's omnipotent, and he's all-knowing, he's omniscient, he's everywhere. It's like, you can't see me. We're naked and ashamed, but you can't see us. And like, who chased after who? Who went to who? God goes to Adam and Eve, and though he says, where are you? He knows exactly where they are, but he's trying to get them, stir them up to know in their relationship, where are they? And it's God who goes after Adam and Eve. And it's God who pursues us. God, through Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, come, they pursue us. God gave the management of the world over to Adam and Eve, and when they sinned, they turned that management over to, to Satan, and here's what you have to understand. Satan comes into our lives through the world, and you know what his voice is? His voice is these, simply this, you're junk. You're no good. <laughs> you're broken. You're full of sin. Who could love somebody like you? Look at your life. Look at you. Look at, and all of a sudden, he's putting all this junk on you, all this trash talk, as it were, no value. Satan sees you as trash. Jesus says, you are treasure. You're not trash. You're treasure. You're so much treasure. I have been looking for you. You're valuable to me. Come on. He seeks you. He finds you. But then he buys you. He buys you. How does he buy us? 1 Peter 1, 18, For you know that it was not with perishable things like silver or gold that you were redeemed or bought from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, Adam and Eve, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He came and he paid the greatest price possible. He didn't negotiate. He didn't go to some flea market and say, that looks pretty good here. What are you willing to take for it? Now nah, that's a little too much. How about we just come down half a little bit? Or you know what? And then, by the way, will you deliver it? You know, because I really don't want to put the effort into it. Jesus comes to you, the treasure, finds you, and he says, I'm going to pay the top price for you. No negotiation. I love you so much, I will pay the full price price his blood on the cross paying for your sins purchasing you redeeming you ransoming you all words that are used in scripture from satan's hold but the great thing about his purchase is he did just didn't buy you and you individually it says he bought the world he bought the world for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. He, he so loved the world in its entirety from beginning to end of all time and of all geography. And it doesn't mean everybody's saved, but the bill has been paid. The price of sins has been paid for anybody willing to receive it. So he comes and he purchases not just you, he purchases everyone. And those that will through repentance and receive forgiveness, they, they come into that. See, we all have free will. We all get to choose who's going to pay for my sins. Who's going to pay? Somebody's got to pay for my sins. It says all have sinned and the wages of sin is death. So who's going to pay for my sins? And God says, hey, I'll pay for them. I'll send my son to pay for your sins, everyone's sins. I've got a bank account that will cover everybody's sins. Yeah, I'm not too sure if I really want you to pay for it. I'll pay for it myself. And God goes, no problem. But if you pay for it, You'll always come up short, and that means you go to hell. God never sends anybody to hell. They choose to pay for their own sins that lead them to being outside of God. Where God says, hey, I'll pay for it. No, I'm, not, I'm, I'm really into myself right now. I'll think I'll do it myself. And God says, that's fine. 
He bought the whole world, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. It says that God was reconciling the whole world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That's what our message goes out. It says, hey, there's somebody that will pay for your sins. You don't have to do it for yourself. And if you let God do it, you get eternal life. If you do it, you have eternal separation, but it's your choice. And that's our ministry. Now, Jesus didn't find you. He bought you. And it says he sell all that he had. All that he had. What, what did Jesus have? Well, it's blood. Okay, is, is that all there was really in its entirety? No, listen to this. Philippians chapter 2 out of the Message Bible. Uh, I love how uh, Peterson puts it, verse 5 to 8. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. All right, let's watch this. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of the status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. He gave all that he had. He gave all that he had in the realm of heaven, the glory, the seated with the Father. All his deity, all the privileges that he had, he gave it all. He says, I'm, I'm going to pay it all to come down to be human, a slave, and identify with the human race, and their sins and temptations. Though I'm sinless, it says that he was tempted in all points as we are. He knew exactly. And he lived a spotless life and died a payment, a crucifixion of all things. That's the value that the Lord has placed on you. And our minds become so befuddled to try to understand that because we look at our natural existence and how people treat us and how people say they love us, but they don't. How they, they say that we're their treasure, but they're really trash. And how the enemy beats us up constantly. But Jesus left everything. That's the value he puts on you. They say you'll pay the price for whatever you value something at. The Lord must really value you and I, that he's willing to pay all that to come to us. He finds you, he buys you, and then he says he hides you. You were hidden once in the field, he comes and he finds you, but then it says he comes and he hides you again. What's that all about? Remember, whatever you value... Whenever you put a value to it, and it's a value to you, it, it's just, you don't just buy it, but now that you have it, you've got to guard it, protect it. You've got to hide it. In our own homes, maybe you've got a safe. Maybe you're putting it in your mattress underneath. All the money is all laying there, and you've got it in the mattress. Maybe you got it in the bank. you got it in a safety deposit box. Maybe you've got that one baseball card that's worth millions that's tucked in, a book that you don't read so nobody else will know that it's there. Hopefully it's not the Bible. But we take it and we hide it because it's of such value to us. We want to keep it safe. Watch what the Lord does for you and I. Colossians 3.3. 3. For you died. Talking about salvation and coming into right relationship. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Through Christ's death and resurrection, he didn't just buy you. All of a sudden, you're hidden as it was with him, with him in Christ, with God. There, there's you, Christ, and God are together. There's this joining together where, where God says, I'm going to hide you in Christ, in who he is, in his spiritual life, and all that he is. I'm going to hide you in him. You're going to take on the shape, the form, the life of Christ. John 10, Jesus says this about you and I. And I give them, you and I, eternal life. And they, you and I, shall never perish. That, that's eternal life. We have presence with God. Neither, watch this, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one's able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. It's always been a great commercial. You're, you're in good hands. You're in good hands. The good hands, people. I can still snatch it out of your hand. I remember that, remember that old kung fu movie. Uh, grasshopper, 
if you can snatch this out of my hand. <laughs> Kung fu. Woof. God says, Jesus says, hey, you're in my hand and you're in the Father's hand. No one can snatch you out of my hand. That's what God says about your value to him. I'm going to put you in my hand, Jesus says. And by the way, you're in the Father's hand. There is all of a sudden the working of God, but it gets better. Watch with this. Watch, watch this. Ephesians 1, verse 13. In him, Christ, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So talking about you hear, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You come into right relationship. Then it says, in whom also, having believed, watch this, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of the inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Listen, Jesus loves you. He finds you gives up everything for for you. You're his treasure. So he hides you with Christ in God. Then watch this. You're in Christ's hand. You're in the Father's hand. And the Holy Spirit comes and seals you. You've got the Trinity getting a hold of your life to guard you and protect you. The Spirit seals you belonging to the King until the day of redemption. You're in here in the earth. You're in Jesus' hand and you're in God's hand. That's how much value you've got to the Lord right now. And I don't know about you, but that rocks me when I think that God loves me that much. That I'm that kind of treasure to him. Trinity gets involved. But lastly, it says this. He rejoices over you. Hebrews 12, 2. says this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When Jesus went to the cross and everything was completed and he rose again, what did he do? He went and sat down. Why did he sit down? Sitting down is done work. You sit down because your task is finished. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. We don't do anything to earn our place with God. We can't love more, we can't give more, we can't serve more, we can't have a perfect attendance in the church, so that would really help, all right? But, just saying, but we don't do anything to earn God's love, earn his redemption, his righteousness, it was done. The joy that was set before him was you. He saw you. He saw finding you. Buying you. Rejoicing over you. You're his treasure. He saw you. And that was the joy that he had. You're his treasure. This is a new Exodus 19.5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. You come into this relationship with God, and God says, because of your obedience and your faithfulness, because you're trusting in who I am, you are a treasure to me. You're a treasure of value to me. Peter writes about this in 1 Peter 2.9. He brings it into the New Testament believers. He says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, his treasure. You're something special to God through Christ. I don't know if you're fully getting this. I, I really hope you are. But you know, the disciples were a little slow. Not like us. We're not slow like them. But the disciples were a little slow. And, and maybe this is why Jesus just puts right on the end of this. He says this in verse 45. And maybe he had a little attitude, maybe. I don't know if Jesus had attitude towards his disciples once in a while. But he, he, in verse 45, he says, again. Okay, again, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he goes, like a merchant seeking pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. It's like, okay, maybe you didn't quite get this treasure, but let me just put it into this merchant pearl thing. And he says, it's the same thing. Your beautiful pearls. That when he found you, he, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. He left earth, becomes a virgin, uh, becomes a child through virgin birth, grows up to be a man, sells all that he has to get a hold of you. You think, well, Jesus is the pearl of great price. Yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah, okay, it works. We sell all for him, yes. But the parable is you're the pearl. 
And Jesus sold it all for you. Gave it all up. Held nothing back. Now remember Paul's words at the very beginning. I was afraid that Satan would deceive you with his words and lure you with the simplicity or simple purity of your love for Jesus. The deception is this. That it's all about you. When it's all about you, it's easy for you to feel forsaken, forgotten, let down, expectations not met. Because it's all about you. But when you make it all about him, his love for you, what he went through to get you, how he spent it all for you, when you make it about you as God, what more can I do? How more, what more righteousness can I do? What more good works can I do? What more finances can I do? What more can I do? And it's like, stop making it about you. It's not about you. It's about God and what Jesus Christ has done for you. Your love for him can only be understood fully when you realize he loved you first. As you were in the earth, in the dirt, broken, hurt, full of rejection, full of bitterness. Gave it all up for you. What a beautiful, beautiful parable. What a beautiful, beautiful parable when we understand the mystery of the kingdom is in there. What is that? It's not about you, it's about Him. Make your life, your walk with Jesus about Him. And when you make it about Him and His love for you, you do things differently. When you realize how much He loved you, you change your walk. You change your people that you hang out with. You change the thing you do. Because it's now not about, oh, I've got to try, try to make myself more lovable to God and i got to love Him. But no, stop, stop. Make it about His love for you. And when you make it about his love for you, that will then set your life on a whole different course. You'll want to read the Bible. You want to pray. You want to get to the house of God. You want to give yourself into all the things that God has for you. You don't want to miss anything because the love of God enraptures you, captures you, sets you apart from anybody else. People say, why? Why? Why do you love Jesus the way you do? Because he first loved me. And all of a sudden, all our relationships change. Because we can love people a lot differently when we understand his love for us. Why don't we stand here this morning? Let's stand and let's commit this word to the Lord right now. I believe that there are hearts right now that you've heard over and over again, you're junk, you're trash, you don't deserve, you're unworthy, you're no good, you'll never meet the standards. And the Lord Jesus wants to come and say, no, I, I come to find you. And when I find you, I buy you. I don't just buy you, I hide you. I don't just hide you, I rejoice over you. Father, I pray the simple parable would come into our hearts today. And God, it would find its place deep in our heart. God, this is one of those scriptures and out of Psalm 119, verse 11, Lord, that we would hide it in our heart that we might not sin against you. Then it becomes our motivation day in, day out, your love for us, of what you did for us, how you came to us, how you bought us and rejoicing over us. God, it becomes the center of our very being. Right now, if there are anyone, God, that, that just can't wrap their mind around this fact that they're treasured, Holy Spirit, come, anoint their minds. Anoint them to know that they know by Scripture they are treasure. They're not trash. They're valuable, not discarded. God, you want to hold on to them and keep them where the world has just said you're a throwaway. God, I pray right now divine healing into every heart and every life. Minister by your Spirit in Jesus' name. As we sing this song, I might not be your normal practice, but it's an act of surrender. Would you find a moment in this song? Lift your hands to the Lord. Lift your hands and say, God, I need this word. God, I need this word in my heart and my life. I, I need you to heal me. I need you to restore me. God, pour out your spirit on us now in Jesus' name. Let's worship. Oh, my words fall short. I got nothing new. How could I express? I could sing these songs as I often do every 
look at me for a minute and just just really want you to get this this morning the world says a lot about us we compare ourselves to a lot of people we get on that facebook and social media and we look at our lives and it doesn't amount to what we see in other people which is only a highlight reel it's not really the truth but we wear and carry this burden that we're not of value so easily come from a broken home or a situation and you bring it all on yourself and it's my fault or just my life and but the Lord specifically tells you you're his treasure so much that he finds you and he buys you and he hides you and he rejoices over you that's his love for you gave it all up just for you 
not for the person next to you, not for your spouse, not for your kid, for you. And until you get to know the love of God, you can never fully love God back because it hinges on you knowing how much he loves you. Father, put that word in our hearts right now. Don't let it fall to the ground. I love Samuel when he, every word that he gave out, it says not a word fell to the ground. Lord, let not, not one of these words fall to the ground. Let it find into the heart, Lord, because your heart, your heart is towards them, every one of us, no matter where we are, how, how hidden we are in the field. You come and you find us. So God, I thank you for this word, and I pray that every heart would be blessed and encouraged and strengthened in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Praise God. We got coffee. We got fellowship. And then we got another week coming ahead of us and next Sunday. So God bless you. Have a great day today. Thank you for all those that get to hang around and help us tear down. God bless you. And if you're new in the house.